On the afternoon of October 20, 2007, the Canadian International Bank of Commerce, also known as CIBC, was open for business as usual when an unexpected customer entered the front doors and approached the line for the tellers. This man, who nobody had seen before, stood in line tenderly holding his right arm, which was in a sling, and his head was wrapped in bandages. When it was his turn, he shuffled his feet carefully as though his legs were unsteady when he walked, and cautiously he moved himself to the counter of the open teller. And when he got there, he didn't say a word. Instead, the sound of papers shuffling in his fingers could be heard, breaking the silence of the bank. And then silently, the man pushed a paper to the teller, sliding it across the counter to her. And when the teller picked it up and read what was written on it, everything changed in an instant. Her eyes darted across the brief but alarming note scribbled on the paper and then darted back up to the man standing in front of her. The note read, Stay calm. Have a gun. Withdraw $4,000 large bills. No games. 60 seconds. Go. The seconds ticked by as the teller absorbed the gravity of the note's message. Time seemed to stand still as she weighed her options. What had initially seemed like an ordinary day had now been transformed into something terrifying. Fortunately for everybody, in the end, the man left the bank, escaping with less than he had demanded, which was only about $1,100. It was a fraction of what he had expected, but the thrill of that bank robbery sparked something inside this man, and he wanted more. But what he did not know was that this day set in motion a series of events that would eventually lead to the murder of those closest to him, and the person responsible for the murder was somebody nobody would have ever expected. Good evening, I'm Janella Massa in Scarborough. Police tape remains here in front of this home on Lawndale Road where three people were killed yesterday in an apparent crossbow attack. Now today we're learning more about exactly what unfolded here yesterday and we're getting more details about the man charged in this bizarre incident. We're learning more about his uh, previous run-ins with the law and his connection with the victims. Okay, let's go. The handsome and popular Brett Ryan lived a comfortable life in Scarborough, Ontario with his parents and three brothers. In 1997, Brett attended the University of Toronto and he did pretty good. But by his fourth year of college, he had suffered through a couple of bad breakups that shook his confidence. He wasn't feeling all that great emotionally. And as the days went by, he was falling deeper and deeper into depression. Brett just could not pull himself together, no matter how hard he tried. And so, he ended up dropping out of university in 2003. But after taking a year off of school and sort of trying to get himself put back together emotionally and mentally, he decided that he was ready to finish his degree. And so in 2005, he re-enrolled at the university again. And again, he failed to graduate. It seemed that school was just not part of Brett's future anymore. So, the next summer, since Brett was not going to school, he needed to do something with himself. His parents were expecting him to start contributing to the household, and so Brett ended up taking a part-time job painting houses. And by the end of summer, Brett's part-time job painting houses had turned into a full-time job, which was great because Brett had extremely expensive taste. He liked to party. He drove a nice car, and he spent a ridiculous amount of money on clothes from shops that he could not afford. Specifically, he often dropped hundreds and thousands of dollars at Versace, Dolce & Gabbana, Gucci, you name it. He loved those high-end stores. He liked to live like he had money, but the fact was all of his money was borrowed. The reality was, his painting job could not keep up with his spending habits, and by his mid-twenties, Brett had accumulated over $60,000 in credit card debt, and he had not saved even a single penny. It was all good, though, because Brett had a plan that would make all of his troubles go away. Or so he thought. On the afternoon of October 20th, 2007, 
26-year-old Brett Ryan put his arm into a sling, applied medical bandages to his face, and walked into the CIBC bank close to his home. And then, Brett Ryan robbed it, escaping with a meager $1,100. It was a small sum of money, but that didn't matter. He was instantly hooked from the rush and how easy it was to suddenly have money. And so, just a few weeks later, he did it again. Only this time, it was a different branch. And then after that, he hit another bank on Christmas Eve. Brett was really getting into this, and at some point, he decided he needed to switch up his disguise. So, he traded in his sling and his bandages for a long beard, a pair of glasses, and a bucket hat. He also added a limp to his walk to really pull together his old man disguise. And then, once he had perfected his costume, off he went, robbing banks in the same fashion with a note and leaving with a few thousand dollars each time. Brett even earned a new nickname. The media had started calling him the Bearded Bandit, and in the span of approximately eight months, Brett had stolen about $54,000. In Brett's mind, he had a really good thing going, but eventually, Brett slipped up and the police spotted him, making his getaway from one of his robberies. After that, they followed him for a few weeks watching as a young man would get into a vehicle and drive to the bank. And then once at the bank, the young man that had gotten into the vehicle had somehow transformed into an old man that exited the vehicle and entered the bank to rob it. Regardless of his appearance, Brett was arrested and when the time came, he pleaded guilty to eight counts of robbery as well as eight counts of using a disguise to commit these robberies. Brett seemed genuinely remorseful for his crimes, and he was intent on turning his life around, and because he had never been in trouble with the law before, the judge was sympathetic and sentenced him to prison for three years and nine months. Luckily for Brett, though, after serving only a year in prison, he was granted parole, and then he moved back in with his family. He also ended up having to file for bankruptcy, and with his newly acquired felony charge, he was facing the very real problem of finding a company willing to hire him. It was 2010 and a felon with the moniker the Bearded Bandit could not hide from a quick Google search. Potential employers did not want a felon working for them and people did not want a felon painting their house either. But eventually, Brett was able to land a job as a server at a restaurant. It was less money than he had been making, but it was better than nothing. And it was during this time that Brett met Kristen Baxter on a blind date. Kristen's life was very different from Brett's. She had a good job and owned a nice condo. And Kristen also knew that Brett had been the bearded bandit. And that fact did not seem to bother her at all. The relationship took off and they fell in love. And before long, Brett moved into Kristen's condo with her in January of 2013. And then shortly after that, Brett and Kristen got engaged. And to make things even more exciting, Brett had also enrolled again at the University of Toronto and was actively looking for work in the technology field. He was ready to turn his life around and was excited for his future with Kristen. But as good as Brett was feeling about his life and the direction it was heading, he was still under stress for money. And sadly, shortly after he and Kristen had gotten engaged, Brett's father passed away. And so, his mother, Susan, was now paying Brett to do odd jobs around the house. But that wasn't enough money for Brett to make ends meet. And to make matters worse, one month before Brett was set to graduate from university, for reasons unknown to anyone, he quietly dropped out of school again. And Brett did not tell anybody. Instead, he told them he did graduate. And further to this, Brett told everyone he had been hired by a Toronto tech firm and he was able to start making some really good money. Now, this job was not a complete lie. Brett really had been hired by a legitimate Toronto tech firm. However, he was quickly fired before he had even started when they entered his name into Google and learned that he had once been the bearded bandit. Brett was devastated, and he could not bring himself to face up to the truth and tell Kristen or his family what had actually happened. And so, he just went on with his life as if he still had the job. Every morning, he prepared for work. He kissed Kristen goodbye, and then he got on the subway. And then in the afternoon, he would come home to Kristen and tell her all about his day at work. But it was all a lie. 
He had literally been riding the subway back and forth all day, every day. And by that summer, Brett's stress came to a boiling point. The obvious problem was that Brett's bank account was practically non-existent. His wedding was just around the corner, and his mother was so proud of him. As far as she knew, he had finally gotten a college degree, had a good job, and within a few months, he would marry a beautiful, successful woman. She was more than happy to help with his finances here and there, but when Brett finally told his mother the truth, the full truth about how he did not graduate university and he did not have a fantastic job and that he was in fact just riding the subway all day, every day, her support turned to anger. And when Brett's mother learned that he had stacked lie upon lie for the past year, she was done. Not only had he not told his family, but more importantly, he had not told Kristen. Brett's solution to his lies and financial problems was to have Susan, his mother, throw more money at the problem and hope it would all work out without him having to tell Kristen. However, that just wasn't an option for Susan. And there she gave him an ultimatum. Either he tells Kristen or she would. But for Brett, this option was no option at all. It just was not going to happen like that. He had worked hard to gain the love of his perfect woman, and he was not about to let his mother blow it for him. No, no. In the days after that argument with his mother, Brett continued to work at her house. As he carried his work materials into the garage, concealed under his arm so nobody could see it, he had brought in a crossbow and its arrows, or bolts as they're called, and he hid them amongst the large pile of construction material. Due to his felony conviction, Brett was not allowed to purchase a firearm, so instead of a gun, he had bought a second-hand youth crossbow. On August 25th of 2016, when Brett arrived at his mother's house, he pleaded with her to not tell Kristen all of his lies, but she refused, telling Brett once again that if he did not tell her, then she would. Susan could see how riled up Brett was, and his irrational behavior was really beginning to make her feel uncomfortable, and so she picked up the phone and called Brett's older brother, Chris, and asked him to come over to help get Brett under control. By this point, Brett was fuming mad. He was also panicked. He did not want Kristen to know any of this, and in his mind, there was only one thing he could do to stop her from finding out. And at that moment, he turned and stormed out of the house and went into the garage and unexpectedly, his mother followed close behind him. Susan was too close behind for Brett to take the time to load the crossbow. So he grabbed one of the crossbow bolts, turned around and stabbed his mother in the cheek with it. Then he pulled it out and stabbed her again. Only this time he pushed the bolt into her ear. This did not kill Susan. No, no, Susan was still alive but she was bleeding heavily and she was struggling for her life. Then Brett pushed his mom down onto the ground where he proceeded to strangle her with a piece of rope until she died. Knowing that his brother Chris was on his way, Brett knew he had to work fast and so he loaded the crossbow and waited quietly behind the door of the garage and without a sound. When Chris entered the garage, Brett placed the point of the bolt at the base of Chris's skull and pulled the trigger, killing him instantly. With his mother and brother now dead and looking at what he had done, Brett set the crossbow down and then dragged Chris's body next to his mother's body and covered them with a tarp and then stepped back. At this point, Brett's clothes were covered in his mother's and brother's blood, but Brett wasn't worried. No, Brett was prepared. He was about to remove his outer layer of clothing because he had worn layers that day in preparation for what had just taken place. And as he went to remove his shirt, he heard his youngest brother's car pull up in the driveway. Without any hesitation, Brett walked out of the garage with a crossbow bolt in his hand as his younger brother AJ walked up the driveway towards him. Brett met AJ and when they got close enough, Brett reached out and grabbed him and at the same time he raised his hand up and drove the bolt hard into AJ's neck. And with that, AJ dropped to the ground, rapidly losing blood. Surprisingly, Brett's third brother, Lee, had been napping inside the house this whole time. And when AJ started screaming because Brett had stabbed him, Lee was ripped out of his sleep. 
Lee jumped up from where he was laying and looked out the window of the house to see what was going on. And he could see his brother AJ lying on the ground in a pool of blood. And he could also see Brett with a bloody bolt in his hand. Lee picked up the phone to call 911, but Brett knew he was inside and he wasn't going to let Lee bring him down. Inside the house, Brett and Lee began to fight viciously, spreading blood all over the house. And after an enormous struggle, Lee got the bolt away from Brett and took off out of the house where he seen that his brother AJ, who was lying in the driveway, was still alive at that point. And before Brett was able to catch him, Lee ran to the neighbor's house screaming for them to call the police. Uh, this neighbor was at home about one o'clock yesterday afternoon and you said all of a sudden you heard a knock on the door. It wasn't a knock, the guy was hammering on the door. I opened the door and he practically fell into my arms, practically knocked me over. Um, he staggered into the front room and fell on the floor and he said call 911, my brother's bleeding in the driveway. Make sure the police come, make sure the police come. He emphasized the police. And it was at that point, Brett realized there was nowhere to run. And so he grabbed himself some water and then sat down on the front steps of his mother's house and waited for the police to arrive. Sadly, AJ only lasted a few minutes longer after Lee had run to the neighbors and he passed away by the time the paramedics arrived. When the police pulled up to the house, Brett told them, the guys in the garage are dead. It was me. Worried that Kristen may have also been one of Brett's victims, the police rushed to their condo. Kristen wasn't there, but the police were shocked by what they found inside. Brett's MacBook Pro was wedged against the wall with weights. The screensaver had been turned off so that the computer would not go to sleep and the browser was open to YouTube. The cursor was hovering above the play button and next to the computer was an oscillating fan set up with a digital timer and duct taped to the fan was a wooden spoon placed next to the enter key. This setup was a crude attempt that Brett had put together in an effort to establish an alibi. So effectively, when the timer went off, the oscillating fan would start and the spoon would hit the enter button, causing the YouTube video to play. That way, Brett could have easily said that he was home watching YouTube videos when the murders occurred. Two similar setups were also found in the condo one using an iPad and another using an iPhone, and both of these were designed to send out emails that had been written earlier on. And all of this was for the purpose of establishing multiple digital fingerprints that could later be used as alibis. In the end, Brett Ryan pleaded guilty to second degree murder of his mother, first degree murder of Chris, and second degree murder of AJ, he was convicted on all three counts, plus the attempted murder of his brother, Lee. Brett is eligible for parole in 2041. So that's going to wrap it up for this video. Thank you for watching. And if you haven't already, please make sure to like, subscribe, and toss a comment below. Let me know what you think, because I would love to find out. And I will see you again later.